Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and today I want to talk to you guys a little bit about why speed work is hypertrophy work. Uh, because this is something that comes up a lot and everyone wants to argue about the speed or the speed strength elements of this type of training and they want to try to point out, well, squat, bench, and deadlift are not speed strength exercises, so this doesn't carry over. And setting all of that aside, I understand the point of that argument. I don't necessarily agree with it, but I understand the point people are trying to make with that argument, but that's not understanding the way the body responds to the speed work or the various training effect of it. And when we look at speed work, you have to understand that if you're exploding as hard as you can, every single rep is an effective rep. We are hitting upper threshold muscle fibers. All right, we're hitting upper threshold muscle fibers, and we're usually doing this stuff with very, very short breaks. So if you look at a typical starting wave, and let's look at it the way I do it and often prescribe it, uh, usually we do up to 12 triples on the speed bench for the first week. And, but even if we go to 10, let's say we do 10 sets of all the speed movements. If in a typical week on your speed bench day, you do 10 triples, what have we done? We've done 30 reps in which you hit upper threshold fibers. Now, if you're doing normal, slow tempo work, what happens? You only really hit those fibers on the last five reps on a set to failure. So in order to get 30 effective reps, that way, you've got to do six sets to failure. All right, you might do 60 reps if it's tens. If you're doing five rep maxes or six rep maxes to failure, probably not the wisest of choice. But if you are, same thing. You've still got to do something in the range of six sets to, to momentary muscle failure to get the same upper threshold fibers. All right. So your pecs, front delts, triceps, all of that are getting very effective hypertrophy work here. And we'll come back to that in a minute of, of how the assistance work fills in the rest of the gaps. Okay, then we get over to the rest of it because look at all the other muscles in the body. We then do usually speed squats on a box and speed pulls, preferably sumo, on the other day, our other speed day. We usually do doubles, 10 doubles. That's 20 reps in which we've hit upper threshold fibers off of the various box squats. Well, what all does that work? It's primary movers, quads, hips, glutes, right? 20 effective reps. It's like basically four sets to failure. If we want to count the upper threshold fibers being hit. And we're doing it all with short breaks, so the work density tends to be really, really good. We're usually taking 60 seconds between. Now, done off of a box, we could argue that there's a little more posterior chain use, hamstrings and things. Well, what about the speed pulls? We're hitting the whole T-spine, traps, quads, glutes, hamstrings. Hamstrings get hit a lot harder on the sumo deadlift than on squats adductors, abductors, again another 20, 20 effective reps if we're doing them as hard and as fast as we can for 10 doubles. So think about that in terms of, of hypertrophy. We could argue that maybe the lats didn't get hit fully effectively, although they did get hit during all this, maybe the biceps, certain parts of the delt. You could make that argument. So all you would really need is some pen lay rows or something to fill in the gaps. So what if on both of those days you did five sets of pen lay rows? Haven't we just effectively worked the entire body? Haven't we hit at least minimum effective volume, if not quite a bit more, for every muscle in the body between those two speed days? What, maybe the side delts got missed? All right, maybe the biceps and triceps need a little more work. Well, that's not hard to throw in. It's not hard to do some extra bicep work or some delt work. But think of that in terms of, of the hypertrophic response. This is hypertrophy training. It is hypertrophy training. At least for most of the big muscles. 
right? Most of the big muscles, it's pretty good hypertrophy work. So people will then say, but you know what about progressive overload and everything else? Well, what do you mean? These are based on percentages of your maxes, right? The stronger you get on your one rep maxes, the more weight we use on these. They're programmed off of it in order to maintain certain bar speeds and to run them in the pendulum waves. There is programming around it. We run three week waves so that we avoid adaptation. So what about weak point training? Well, that's why weak point training matters because these are variations of your classic squat bench and deadlift that are being used for a big chunk of your hypertrophy. So if you come in and you fill in the weak gaps with other movements, what happens? And, and that's why this matters for the progressive overload perspective and, and getting strong and jacked. If we're not using the one rep maxes for hypertrophy so much, although they do have some training response, but we're using them to, again, learn to get strong, to learn to produce maximum force against maximum weights, but we also use them to test strength and find our weak points. Because that's the other thing. You can't always tell weak points from work sets. We can tell when we get under a heavy load. So if you identify the weak points and you find for each of those lifts, your various pressing, squatting, pulling, you find the weakest muscle from your max work and then you do extra training volume for it, that means that you get stronger. And if you get stronger, that means you can now do more workload on the speed work. So, for example, let's say that it turns out your triceps. The triceps are the weak link in the speed bench, or in your benching in general. And you do a bunch of close grip benching and some JM presses and, or extensions. And you get your triceps thicker, and all your benching goes up. Well, that means your speed bench is also going to go up proportionate. So that means, again, we're going to get more workload done with all of the muscles on the speed work, which accounts for a big chunk of our hypertrophy training. So that means everything is going to grow. Let's come back over to the, the squatting, the box squatting, sumo pulls. Those both work over half of the muscle in the body. So what happens if we look at those and say, okay, my, my hamstrings are the weak link, or my T-spine is the weak link. And then you come in and you do a lot of work for your hamstrings or your thoracic spine so that they get thicker and stronger. Well, that means you're now going to improve your workload on your squatting and pulling, which also means that the workload is going to increase on the speed work. It's going to make the whole body grow. It's going to make the whole body grow. In fact, one could argue that for anyone but the really advanced lifter, this system with speed work thrown in, if all you do is plenty of rowing and things for your back, and then put other hypertrophy training into your weakest muscle on each of these things, that your whole body would probably grow maximally. Right? Your body would probably grow maximally across the board. Why wouldn't it? Because if you, again, you do all the rowing to address the muscles maybe not getting worked. And people say, well, couldn't I do pull-ups or chin-ups? No, they don't work your upper back that well. They work your mid-back fantastically. But then you're neglecting your upper back. What's, what do I mean by upper back? I mean most of your traps. Mid-traps. Even upper traps, lower traps, rhomboids, rear delts. Those things don't get hit particularly well with pull-ups and chin-ups. Right. They work your lats amazingly well. Your biceps. I'm not saying you couldn't do some. It's just not going to enhance your other lifts as much. You could do some chin-ups. It's fine. But if you do all back work, and then you address whatever the weakest links are in those other three lifts, what's going to happen? Your, your whole body's going to grow. Because you'll be able to continue to enhance the workloads on the speed work. And the speed work is responsible for a big chunk of our growth on a training system like this. And it, and it should be considered hypertrophy work. It meets all the criteria for hypertrophy work. And not only, not only does it hit all the workloads that we want, but it's really easy to recover from. Speed work has really good stimulus to fatigue ratios, in spite of the fact that a lot of it is axial loading. We get very large numbers of effective reps, and most of the muscles in the body with exercises 
and the way that we perform them that have a very high stimulus to fatigue ratio. That's ideal hypertrophy training. All right, guys, but well, that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time.